Yeah, we're going to follow through with the precedent in not really, in not introducing um, the speakers on the assumption that they do indeed know, need no introduction. But um, before we start, I do want to add, um, point out one aspect of the speaker list that might not be obvious to everyone here. Um, I don't know if everyone knows this, but this is not the first time that Carl and Stathis have actually been at the same institution at the same time. Um, in the course of their academic careers, um, took them both to the LSE for... How long did you guys over that? Okay. And there's a sense in which um, the speaker, there's a, there's a sort of LSE reunion aspect <laughs> to the speaker list because then there's a number of people here who have, have interacted with um, Carl or Stathis at the LSE. So Craig, for example, um, um, were, were they both there when you were there? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, John. That's where I left. <laughs> John Morrow of the course, but I think Elliot, you you visited there, and um, Murphy has also been a visiting So, well, Peter, now we're all. Matthias was also there. At the other. Matthias also. Okay. All right. Did I did I did I miss anybody? <laughs> Thank well, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm really delighted to be here and to honor um, Carl and Stathis arrival here. Um, one of the problems with giving a talk at Western Ontario is that I was a PhD student here, and every time I come to give a talk, it makes me feel like I'm a PhD student all over again, <laughs> which is rather daunting to be in the crowd here. So. <laughs> um, so what I want to talk about today then is um, perspectivism, really. I, the title's Inconsistent Models, Problems and Perspectives. Um, and I'm going to say some things about models, but um, really I think the, the title should probably have been Perspectivism and its Problems. But um, anyway, so let me, let me start by just with a bit of background which does relate to models. Um, so, one of the problems that's been long-standing in the literature on models is the issue of inconsistency and how do you deal with uh, problems, or how do you deal with cases where there are a lot of inconsistent models for the same phenomenon. Um, and it's one of the biggest challenges for unification, um, but it's also a problem just for uh, assessing the epistemic accuracy on the model. If you've got a lot of different models for the same phenomena, each of them say different things, how do you, <coughs> excuse me, how do you actually determine um, you know, what's right? How do you actually pick out uh, what uh, the, the model is saying that's actually right about the system? Um, so how should we think about these models then? Well, and what if anything relates them to each other? Because very often they're completely disparate. Um, so this is a natural topic for perspectivism. So the question is, if we do adopt a kind of perspectivism, does that help us to resolve the theoretical inconsistencies that we get with different models? Well, there's two kinds of perspective, well, there's at least two kinds of perspectivism. Um, the first is the kind of larger epistemic notion of perspectivism, which is a general claim that there's no view from nowhere. Um, and that perspectivism is just more or less about human cognitive agents use your epistemic uh, resources um, to engage with the world and to acquire knowledge about the world. But I think even if, I'm not going to argue the pros and cons of that, um, but if, I think even if you accept that kind of perspectivism, it doesn't necessarily commit you to a narrower kind of perspectivism, which is scientific perspectivism. Um, and that's a more restrictive view in that it makes a specific claim about models or theories. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that uh, later on. So perspectivism has had a very um, distinguished history. Um, Leibniz, Kant, Nietzsche, Wittgenstein even. Um, and in more contemporary literature, um, it's argued for by Ben Frass, and he's not explicit in calling what he argues perspectivism, but you can certainly see it as a kind of perspectivism where he discusses representation and says that no representation, there is no representation other than the way things are used or taken by 
to users. Um, Ron Geary is probably one of the biggest proponents of perspectivism um, in his book in 2006 called Scientific Perspectivism. He argues for a lot of different variations, um, talks about color vision and then extends that to scientific observation via instruments um, that are only sensitive to particular input. Um, and he also talks about um, theoretical perspectivism. And he says knowledge we get comes only from one perspective or another. Now, um, so I'm going to go on and talk about just what perspectivism is, but just to give you the, the sort of conclusion before I, I give you the talk, um, <laughs> what I'm going to say is that I don't really think perspectivism is of any help um, with the problem of conflicting models. And the cases where it is of, of some help, there's already, the problem is already solved, I think, within the theoretical framework that the models are presented in. Um, there is, I think, a large um, area where perspectivism is used in science, um, but again, where perspectivism is used successfully in science, I think it's already embedded in the theoretical framework that we start with. So in other words, I think philosophical perspectivism or scientific perspectivism defined as a sort of philosophical thesis is it really good? In, is it, it doesn't really do any work for us. I think it's, it's really a, a sort of vital position. Okay, so I'm going to talk first then about perspectivism and some of the difficulties. Then we'll get two uh, uh, different examples of models. One where you have compatible models, another case where you have inconsistent models. And um, then I'm going to talk in this time finally about what I think is really the the sort of paradigm case of perspectivism, which is scaling and scaling variance, and then uh, some conclusions. Okay, so let's start off then with, um, again, I'll go back to the issue of many models. How is it that you can extract information from all of these different models that give you a variety of different, uh, uh, different information about the phenomenon that you're interested in? Um, so there's two approaches, I think, to uh, talking about the epistemic value of a model, uh, talking about how you extract information from idealized models. The first is just the scientific example, or the scientific approach, rather, where you use approximation techniques, um, the addition of parameters, and that enables you to work with the model to solve empirical problems and they can be accurate for a particular purpose. So you've got an idealized model, you want to be able to apply it to a concrete situation, um, you use approximation techniques, you add parameters that make the model more realistic, and you just tinker around with it, basically. Um, but then there's the philosophical question, um, and that is a slightly more ponderous. Um, you focus on questions concerning the interpretation of the model. Well, is the model a fictional thing? And if it's a fictional thing, how do fictions deliver information? Uh, is it an abstract entity? How should we understand the claim that the model has? All of these kinds of things that philosophers are interested in um, that scientists are not so much interested in. They will just want to be able to tinker with the model and get it to work. Philosophers are interested in how we should interpret the model and how we should interpret the information we get from the model. So. <clears throat> the latter question, the philosophical questions, usually involve issues about realism. Um, and again, the challenge is, of course, to understand where you have really contradictory models. How do you talk about realism in a context like that? Well, the response to that philosophical problem has been to offer a couple of different sorts of weakened versions of realism, and perspectivism has been one of those weakened versions of realism. Um, and Ron Geary says that he thinks of perspectivism as a kind of middle ground between strong realism and strong constructivism. Okay, so just what exactly is perspectivism? Well, um, and most of these, all of these quotes actually are from Ron, so we see page numbers there um, from his 2006 book. Um, he says, laws of nature should be understood as general principles that define a perspective but make no general claims about the world. Models constructed with the aid of principles and specific conditions and in accordance with the perspective can make specific claims about specific parts of the world. 
then you take those claims, you test them against other instrumental perspectives, where instrumental perspectives are uh, what you arrive at using idealized versions of data that you get from your instruments. Um, so what the idea here is you re uh, reject any notion of a complete model in favor of contingency and some good fit to a specific aspect of the system. So representational models then are designed so that the elements of the model can be identified or coordinated with features of the world. But representation is a four-place relation. So it involves S, the user, um, using some particular thing X to represent R for purposes P. So we've got the user and the purpose entering into defining what, the representa what a representation is. So for example, and this is another claim made by Ron, that um, the speed of light is a fundamental constant of nature, but only relative to the perspective in which it appears. So everything, quite literally, takes on a perspectival nature. Um, so we don't have to assume there's only co one correct model for a physical system. We can use quantum models when it suits us. We can use classical models when it suits us. So from the perspective of theory T, model M represents S in a particular way. So we don't even want to ask, is our model correct or is our model wrong? <coughs> we always have to define the perspective. So the, the question of fit will always depend on the purposes for which the model is constructed, and it's going to be user dependent. So the user will define what he or she wants from the model, what the purpose is, and then that will determine what the fit is. So the result is an account of science, he, Ron says, that brings observation and theory, perception and conception, closer than they have been in objective accounts. And perspectivism does not degenerate into silly relativism. Well, maybe not silly, but I think it does degenerate into relativism. Um, so some queries then that arise from this kind of view of perspectivism. How do we answer the general question, is a particular model accurate, an accurate representation of the system? Well, the answer is we can't, because we need to always address a particular perspective to do that. Um, but how then is that going to help us solve the problem of interpreting models that, inconsistent, that, are, that are inconsistent or extracting information that those models provide? I don't think we need to assume there's only one correct model for a system. We don't need to assume there's only one complete model. Um, but I think it shouldn't follow from that that contradictory models are OK, um, that that's particular, particularly fine um, as the sort of end game. Um, perspectivism allows that. And perspectivism is completely happy with contradictory models. Um, so I think while there may not be a view from nowhere, I don't think it follows that there should be a view from everywhere. So I think that there, we need to be able to find some kind of middle ground because I think quite literally perspectivism just opens too many doors and allows too much in. Okay, so um, there is, though, I mean, science does seem to invoke perspectivism, if not explicitly, then certainly implicitly, in a number of different contexts. So is there a way of using perspectivism without what I think are these undesirable consequences, like relativism and, and instrumentalism? Um, well, as I said at the beginning, yes, but I think only because you've already got a more or less unified background or theory um, in place. Um, that allows you to make sense of the of what the perspective uh, of how perspectivism um, solves you, solves some problems in the modeling context. So I think what empowers perspectivism is not a philosophical view of the sort that um, uh, I mentioned, but rather um, a particular theoretical framework that grounds it. So one example where you've got a lot of different. Uh, models for a particular system is in cases of turbulence, modeling turbulent flows. Um, there is a severe problem treating turbulence generally. Um, what happens is <clears throat> when you introduce statistical averaging, you introduce as a result a lot of unknown correlations into the flow equations. 
And so the, the models, the turbulence models then, are just um, sets of relations that are used to determine these unknown correlations. Um, there's two basic kinds of turbulence models, um, eddy viscosity models, which characterize transport and energy dissipation. And then there are Reynolds stress models, which use a number of different methods for determining the correlations. Um, the problem is that there, the ability of the model to represent the flow depends on a lot of complex conditions. So there's a lot of complexity involved in the modeling context. So objective constraints regarding the legitimacy of the models are very, very difficult to assess. Now, <clears throat> the eddies are always modeled in a highly unrealistic way. Um, and a lot of the differences among the different models that are used are just different ways of specifying parameters or different aspects of the flow that the other models have left out. But the overall difficulty, a big, big difficulty for just turbulence modeling in general, is determining the length scale distribution in the flows. So the models are always constructed relative to a problem context and often chosen for a combination of complexity and solvability. So here you've got, we can't read this, but um, th this is a case where you, there's a specification here of all of the different uh, large eddy models. So, I mean, you just look at this, like there's just, you know, so many of them. You have a, a, a similar uh, number, and this isn't even all. This is just a kind of representative list of Reynolds averaging models. <coughs> Now, that sounds like a problem for perspectivism, right? That sounds exactly like the sort of thing where perspectivism can give us a, a, a good insight into what's going on. And it's true, it can. Perspectivism is exactly the sort of approach that you take here when you're trying to determine what model you should use in what context. Um, but the interesting thing about these models is while they all involve different approaches for idealizing the nature of the fluid and for uh, calculating the parameters, um, they don't contradict the basic assumptions of fluid dynamics. So the background theory, all of those models describe the fluid differently, um, the process of adjusting the constraints to match flows, etc. But there's no contradiction with the underlying structure of fluid dynamics. So you can understand the situation in terms of a kind of perspectivism, but a perspectivism that encompasses a sort of unifying approach to the problem. And that's because there's no <coughs> essential contradiction implicit in the use of these different kinds of models. So perspectivism here is working just fine, but it's working fine because you've got this background theoretical context, namely, the basic equation for fluid dynamics that none of these mo that all of these models obey. Um, so it's not the philosophical view of perspectivism that's doing the work here. It's the, the basic unifying background that allows you to think of these models as just different ways of plugging in parameters. So perspectivism here works quite well, but it works quite well because it's scientifically motivated, because the, what grounds it is this background theory. Um, now, so let's look at a slightly different example, which is um, nuclear models. Um, nuclear models, uh, on the face of it, look, uh, the, the modeling situation looks very similar to the, uh, the fluid dynamics cases. There are over at least 30 different kinds of nuclear models. Um, there are three main types that represent uh, the gaseous liquid uh, uh, phase, the um, uh, shell model, liquid drop model, and then uh, molecule-like models or cluster models. Um, and then there is also a, a fourth type, which is based on, um, on, quark, on quark models, but they're uh, used less, off, less often. But each of these different models is also based on different assumptions. Um, and each provides a different account of nuclear structure and also of nuclear dynamics. So here we've got, again, a similar kind of thing. We've got a, the, the theory, we've got up here, we've got the weak nuclear force, strong force, nuclear clustering, and uh, very, very strong force. We've got quark models. 
then you've got sort of different models that are in each of these theoretical catchment areas, as it were. Then you've got the supporting data for each of these models. So that's one way of actually uh, grouping the models together according to the kind of theoretical background they have and the kind of, um, of uh, empirical support that they have. But you can also group them together in a different way. You can group them according to microscopic models, you can group them according to uh, collective models, and also uh, a combination of the two. Um, so the problem is that when you look at the, the group according to theory, um, each of those models within the particular theoretical uh, domain um, says completely different things than the other models do. And um, similarly up here, even within these classifications of microscopic models, those models say very different things within that classification as well. So all of the experimental data, when you look back and you see all of these different kinds of modeling uh, going on with the nucleus, most of the experimental data are actually accounted for by all of those models. But the problem is that a lot of basic issues about the nature of the nucleus are just left completely unanswered. Um, so the, no one is able to give a determination of the phase state of nuclear matter, the nature of nuclear forces, uh, even the nature of nucleons themselves. Not only does each of the model have diff models have different parameters, but it assumes very different characteristics of what the nucleus is like, uh, what nuclear forces are like. Um, so all of those first order issues that relate to the nature of the nucleus, like sizes, spins, and binding energies, are all left unanswered within this picture because all of the models are saying different things. There doesn't seem to be any kind of common ground that you can actually um, appeal to. And you say, well, you know, why all the problems? Don't we have, you know, quantum chromodynamics is the theory of the uh, theory of the strong force in the nucleus? Um, isn't that a unified theory? Shouldn't we be able to get, you know, some models that we can at least um, appeal to QCD as the as the, the sort of background theory? The problem is, is that nuclei don't really fit very well into that framework. They're too complex. They contain too many constituents. And they can't really be handled precisely by formal theories. They're, they're very small and idiosyncratic, to be, uh, too small and idiosyncratic to be handled by statistical methods that require large numbers to justify them. So because they contain less than 300 constituents, they are in this kind of no man's land between reliable statistics and theory. So they don't really fit into the, the theory that supposedly governs the nucleus, but you can't get reliable statistics to treat them either. So all of these different kinds of models then involve different structure, different fundamental assumptions. What do we do? How do you understand, how do you try to extract useful information from these sorts of models? The most you can do is say, well, taken as a classical system, it looks the nucleus looks like this. Taken as a quantum system, it looks like that. Um, but that's not really a satisfactory option, because none of those perspectives can be claimed to represent the nucleus, even in a quasi-realistic way. There's also problems, basic problems with the dynamics uh, between these models and the dynamics of the, the Pauli principle. So fundamental assumptions of quantum mechanics seem to be violated with a number of these models. So here we've got perspectivism that leads to a very, very strong form of in instrumentalism. Um, now, of course, there's nothing, there's no sort of scientific motivation here. People are just at sea with respect to how to understand these nuclear models. So if you say, well, okay, let's adopt a kind of philosophical view about this and, and try and, and uh, e e bring in uh, scientific perspectivism to try and solve these problems, what do you do? Well, you're just left with instrumentalism. You're left, you're, you're no further ahead um, because the models all contradict each other. Um, and you're forced to say that there's nothing really meaningful you can say when you want to answer questions about first-order issues. So 
If we think that there's something called the atomic nucleus and that it has a particular structure and dynamics, then um, perspectivism here is completely constrained by, by scientific facts. So no philosophical interpretation is going to solve this problem. Um, because the, 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 the scientific facts just prevent any kind of coherent uh, account that's going to be solved by perspectivism. So, in the first case where you have the turbulent models, you can employ perspectivism, but perspectivism is already sort of implicit. In this case, you, there's, there's no coherent background theory. You employ perspectivism, what you get is instrumentalism. So perspectivism isn't really doing us any favors here. It's not doing us any work. Um, now, um, how much time do I have? You've got 15 minutes. 15, okay, that's good. Um, okay, so those two issues, or those two examples then, um, show us two very different um, ways of, of uh, using perspectivism. Um, let's contrast those with another case of what I think is really the ultimate kind of perspectivism in science, and that's um, <coughs> the scaling. <coughs> excuse me. Scale invariance and um, and uh, renormalization group transformations, and I think this is really a case where. Um, you really do have a very, very obvious kind of perspectivism going on, but it's, or being used rather, but it's perspectivism that, again, I don't think bears any relationship to scientific perspectivism as it's defined as, in terms of a, a sort of philosophical position. Okay, so um, scale invariance. I think we can think about scale invariance as a kind of hierarchical organization. Um, that results in power law behavior over a, a wide range of, of values for a control parameter. So what's power law behavior? Well, it's a, a functional relation between two quantities where one varies as a power of another. And an example is the inverse square law. Um, earthquakes are another example of power law behavior. Um, the um, Number of cities having a certain population size varies as a power of the size of the population. <coughs> there are all sorts of examples of, of uh, power law behavior. So the exponent of the power law then is going to be a number that characterizes the system. And um, universality, as we um, understand it in statistical physics and statistical mechanics, where you have very different systems like liquids and magnets behaving in exactly the same way, um, what, what that's a result of is that the exponents, the, the, uh, the, the, the power law or critical exponents that are used to describe those systems, um, actually turn out to be the same. So the exponents um, for diverse systems partition themselves into distinct classes. So you can get these sorts of systems, like liquids and magnets, behaving identically at, at critical point, even though they have very, very different microstructures. So they be exhibit the same kind of power law behavior. So those diverse systems then have certain kinds of generic things in common, even though their, micros their microstructures can be very different. Um, so scalar variance and universality actually hold for a large number of complex systems. Um, they hold for financial markets, um, other kinds of, of economic systems. Um, they, they, it's in statistical mechanics, um, a large, large number of, of different sorts of complex systems all display scale invariance and universality. So, scale invariance we can think of, in, in addition to the, the sort of hierarchical uh, organization, we can define it as looking at the system from different distance scales, um, we can see that the, the statistical properties are the same. And I'll talk a little bit about that um, in a few minutes. And um, universality, 
then if we look at, for example, the study of firm growth in diverse countries, we see that they have st uh, similar statistical properties, even though the economies might be radically different. So here we see that um, in an economic context, we see this kind of universality where we've got very different economies, but the growth of firms in those countries display certain common statistical behavior in the same way that liquids and magnets display the same kind of statistical behavior, even though they're very, very diverse uh, uh, phenomena. Okay, so what the renormalization group does then is allow you to investigate how these physical systems change as their, their scales change. So um, it describes, the be and it also describes the behavior of these systems as they reach critical point, and allows you to calculate the critical exponents for each of the systems. So we get these scaling, uh, this scale invariance, and we want to look at the system as it evolves through different, uh, as it changes uh, scale, as it increases its length scale, for example. And what the renormalization group allows us to do is calculate the different values that the parameters of that system will have um, as it, it uh, changes its length scale. So what it does, it, or what's involved then, is a process of coarse graining over very small scale correlations. And this coarse graining results in constructing uh, a self-similar replica of the system at a different distance scale. So, um, so perspectivism then, how does that, how does, what, how does this relate to perspectivism? Well, step by step, the gaze of the investigator, as you pass, as you do apply the renormalization group and do these calculations and the length scale of the system is changing, the gaze of the investigator focuses on larger and larger length scales. So each scale is going to reduce the degrees of freedom and irrelevant couplings until the system reaches a fixed point where further iterations, further applications of the, of the uh, renormalization group equation result in no change to the system whatsoever. Um, and so you reach the fixed point, there's no more change to the system, and the, the values of the fixed point determine the, the generic macro behavior um, of the system. So, Using the renormalization group, then, what you calculate is a new ensemble from um, using the larger length scale from and the previous ensemble. So the iteration of that transformation, then, produces a whole sequence of corresponding physical systems with the same long-range behavior. Very different short-range behavior, but the same long-range behavior. So each system then gives you a different perspective on, on the system. It gives you, you're creating a different system with a different perspective, um, but with the same long-range behavior. The important thing here to point out, I think, is that, and this often, I think, is, is slightly confusing, it's not that it's the same system from a different <coughs> perspective. You are actually quite literally looking at a different system, but with the same structure and on a different magnification scale. So you change the values of the system each time you uh, apply the equation. You get a very different perspective, but yet with the same, the, the same long-range behavior. So the parameters of the theory then are going to typically describe the interactions of the components. And they can be varying couplings that measure the strength of the forces or the masses of the parameters. So in, in quantum electrodynamics, for example, the electron at short distances is going to have a different charge than it does at large distances. And that change, or the running value of the electric charge, is determined by the, the renormalization group equation. So it really does give you or furnish you a kind of uh, way of, of looking at the system from looking at different perspectives um, that the system has. And similarly, in, in, uh, there are a lot of different ways of, of uh, using renormalization group um, in, in uh, uh, quantum field theory. Uh, there's a, the momentum space uh, renormalization group in uh, condensed matter physics. You get real space renormalization, which is usually involves a lattice 
structure and you define a Hamiltonian on an initial lattice and then you uh, get an effective Hamiltonian on a lattice of double spacing. So, so you start off with a lattice that looks like that and then after coarse graining you get a lattice that looks like that. And so the Hamiltonian on the first one, on that one then um, uh, gets uh, uh, after an application of, of the renormalization group equations you use the transition from the first to the second as a rule for obtaining the parameters of the, uh, the second uh, lattice from those of the first. So the iteration then produces a correspondence between the original lattice, that one, and the new one, that one, um, <coughs> different coupling strengths and different temperatures. So each time you get a very different um, uh, values for the, for the specific parameters that you're interested in, but, um, and those values change uh, as you get these, uh, as you get applications of the, of the group. So what the renormalization group does then is allow you to bridge the scales between the micro and the macro. And I think here perspectivism takes on a very important role. Um, not only is it ubiquitous across complex systems, and, and renormalization group is used in all of these systems to, um, uh, to uh, illustrate universality, but the perspective is defined by the mathematical methods that, em that are employed to understand the critical behavior in either financial markets or statistical physics or quantum field theory. Um, it's not about choices and purposes. It's about understanding specific features of the system that can only be understood using these kinds of perspectival techniques. So in other words, you can only find out what the stable properties of the system are, the properties that define the universality class that the system belongs to. Um, you can only calculate those exponents um, that define the universality class using the renormalization group. So this whole kind of perspective or perspectival approach um, is what enables us to actually uh, explain and determine what the long range uh, behavior of these systems actually is. But in all of these cases, it's got nothing to do with purposes or choices. I mean, purposes in the sense that you want to understand the system. But um, the perspectivism here is very much driven by um, uh, a scientific or mathematical technique and an attempt to understand the nature of these kinds of systems, to understand why wild markets behave in the way that they do. Equilibrium models and economics don't help you do that. You need this kind of framework to understand these. Um, these wild market fluctuations. In fact, the, the 2008 crash that was largely the result of many people think um, too much faith put in the Black-Scholes equation. Um, Black-Scholes was developed on the kind of theory that was shown to be incorrect from the perspective of renormalization group equations. So it's a, there's lots of interesting parallels between financial markets and, and statistical physics that are now being developed in the physics. Okay, so conclusions. So each of the cases that I've looked at, the turbulence model cases, the nuclear cases, and the, the renormalization group case, illustrates um, a use of perspectivism that's radically different in each case. But in all of those cases, the successful use of perspectivism is grounded in theoretical relations or particular kinds of mathematical structures used for understanding the system. Um, it doesn't look anything like the scientific perspectivism that uh, emphasizes perspectival dependence on laws of nature. So I think if perspectivism, if scientific perspectivism as a philosophical position is really intended to facilitate a better understanding, then the types of situations that I've looked at here where perspective is important, um, scientific perspectivism has been pretty much on the road. Thank you. Hey, let's
criticism problem? Just to be fair, um, I, I would have I would have thought that the the motivation for perspectivism, at least in the case of my was at a at a much more basic level. So it was supposed to answer a question about how mathematical frameworks apply to phenomenal worlds in the first place. I mean, I wouldn't agree that he solved that problem or even posed it coherently. <laughs> yeah, yeah you, you, you may be right. I mean, but I don't know that he, um, I mean, I, I, I stuck him in there because a lot of people refer to him as also being a champion of this kind of perspectivism. And, um, you know, to some, you can read it like that, certainly. But at the same time, I think there's, he's not, he, he doesn't have the kind of obvious take on perspectivism that Geary has. I mean, Geary is really set out to defend this <coughs> strong notion of perspectivism um, as, a, a, as a middle ground between realism and constructivism. And I, I wouldn't put Boss into that category. So, um, you know, I, I, I Maybe incorrect here to you know tar him with that brush. Um, well, does that mean that I mean, represented in this way, Gary's view, which you plausibly represented as leading to a kind of instrumentalism, but is it really just a kind of instrumentalism minus the idea that we're free to use whatever instruments we like? It's the instrumentalism plus the idea that there's something about our perspective that we can't help in us. That the part of it? I yeah. I mean, I think it. There's the problem is is that I think perspectivism. There there are different levels of perspectivism, um, and it's not clear to me. And, and maybe you know maybe this is true that if you adopt the kind of general perspectivism, <coughs> excuse me, of say Kant for example. Um, or if you want to say, well, look, you know, there's no view from nowhere. Um, you know, there, there has to be a kind of notion of perspective that's built into just human cognition generally. Um, so I'm not unhappy with that, but I don't think it follows from that that you then can extend or that you have to extend perspectivism to the level that um, that Ron takes it to, which to say, well, look, um, you know, the speed of light is only a constant is only a constant of nature uh, relative to a particular theory. Um, then there there's no there are no claims about the world. Then <laughs> there are only claims about theories, and that's the kind of instrumentalism that I don't think really helps us in any way when we're trying to, to look at science and understand what's going on. So as a, as a sort of, as a philosopher, um, and as a philosopher of science, what you're trying to do, I think, is to look at scientific practice um, and, and look at, you know, the philosophical tools that you have and say, well, you know, how can I understand this practice better? How can these philosophical tools help me to understand this practice better? Um, and what I'm saying is that it, I don't think scientific perspectivism even comes close to being able to do that work. Because in the cases where perspectivism seems to play a very prominent role in science, and I'm certainly not denying that it does. I mean, those two examples I gave were intended to show that it does have a, a very important place in science. Um, that place can be understood completely without appealing to any kind of scientific perspectivism that leads us down the instrumentalist road. Rick Chris next. Yeah, I was curious uh, to hear more about the case of nuclear ones. And just let me, I mean, there's the argument you're making about perspectivism, but the, there are several questions I have, just partly because I'm more familiar with physics, about exactly what the nature is of the incompatibility between the various models you discussed. So just to, to get clear on the claim, was it that uh, there's cases where, so granted you can't derive things from QCD, 
you know, that's yeah. Okay. Um, but are there cases where you have different models that just directly conflict and one saying P and one saying not P in areas where the people who developed the models thought they should be reliably describing the situation? Or is it more that if you extend them and take it as a complete account that it conflict? Or you know, what's the nature of the conflict? Yeah, the nature of the mostly what's the, the sort of the way the models were developed it has usually been in just in response to data. Mm -hmm. um, and there's been a, a, quite a bit of attempt to try to um, actually uh, combine some of these models together. Mm -hmm. The collective model, for example, was an attempt to try to bring together different kinds of assumptions about um, the, from the different sorts of models to try to account for a, at least some of the data within a, a coherent framework. But part of the problem is is that you know it's the models contradict each other on all kinds of things. They contradict each other on just what the nature of nuclear matter is. They contradict each other on um, what binding energies ought to be. They contradict each other on just quantum, you know, is the nucleus a quantum uh, uh, entity? Is it a classical entity? Um, they contradict, uh, many of them contradict the exclusion principle. Mm -hmm. So there's all sorts of just like ad hocery going on here. Um, and so they, they not only contradict each other, but they contradict very fundamental aspects of, of theory like quantum mechanics um, itself. So if you can't take a particular model, say, or, or even a few of them, and say, well, okay, we've got a pretty coherent structure here that maybe doesn't account for a lot of things, but accounts for a sufficient number of things, and then we've just got outliers. It doesn't even, there's not even that ability to kind of gain coherence. So the whole thing is a bit of a mess. Um, and, you know, the people agree that it's a mess. Um, it's not that there's, you know, you, you don't need a philosopher to come in and say, well, right now. So there are a few articles in physics. Yeah, and if you, know you how this thing yeah, be. that's right. And if you look at books on, you know, uh, on nuclear physics, you know, there'll be pages and pages of models and, you know, yes, well, you know, uh, these models really, uh, they all say different things, but, you know, uh, maybe one day they'll all be one happy family. But it, so there's, there's a big problem. Um, and, you know, that, so that looks like the kind of problem is a problem that perspectivism, you know, is the sort of, you know, really poised to solve. But of course, you can't solve it because you know it's just that's the way it is. It is what it is, and you know perspectivism is not going to add anything more to our understanding of that because it's a fundamental scientific problem. Um, so, so to get back, you know, where it's useful, it's redundant, and where it's not useful, it's not useful. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, um, so I just wanted to press you about a whole point um, of the points that you were in the morning to make about the normalization. Could you just speak up just a little bit? Yep, sure. Wants to know what the main point I was trying to make about the renormalization group stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so I can sort of appreciate that uh, looking at a system, thinking about the ice model or something, box kind of models, uh, looking at a system at different um, so distances, if you like, right? Um, this is an so the, you can think of those as different perspectives. Though. So from one, from one perspective, I've got four spinning particles. From a bit further away, I have one particle. Um, and if you, um, yeah, if you want to call those different distances in which I as, as different perspectives, then that seems fine, right? Um, but the renormalization group, right, isn't a perspective. It's a way of linking together and compensating for the changes, these changes in the perspective. So um, was the point that there are, in these systems, there are different perspectives that one can take on it, but a perfectly but well-defined relations between them or something, so they're not problematic from a real point of view? Like, what was the overall point? The overall point was that um, 
if you take um, something like scale invariance, right, um, and you look at the combination of scale invariance and universality, um, those two properties are just ubiquitous across all kinds of complex systems. Now, those two properties involve the way that we get information um, about systems by um, looking at those at scale invariance and universality is through an application of the renormalization group. So the renormalization group becomes for us the tool that enables us to look at these different perspectives that um, with, that eventually allow us to, you know, calculate different values for the system as we move to different length scales and eventually to a fixed point. So we get the, um, the, the sort of the behavior, the universality classes, get defined as a result of the application of the renormalization group because that's what enables us to calculate the exponents. But the whole point here is that in, in understanding these systems, what we're doing is we're going from, we're using an ensemble, say we think about it in, in statistical mechanics terms, we're using an ensemble and then we're then by an application of, of RG generating a different ensemble. So we're moving to a different perspective. And we're doing that all the way up till we get to the fixed points. So, so this is, I'm not sort of saying renormalization group is a perspective. That's the tool that allows us to, to move for, to these different perspectives. But the perspectives are what enable us to actually get this, in the end, um, this information about the system that allow, that um, uh, will, where we can fit the different systems into different universality classes. Can I please? Yeah. yeah. So is the philosophical point here, is it, some, is it sort of analogous to, right, think about sort of Robert Nozick's treatment of um, the Lorentz curve, right, and, and the work that Wigner did with it, right? So that when you have a, a system in, in, in space time, we can we change our perspective. As we change our perspective, the system seems to change. But by looking at the properties of the transformations that take us from one perspective to another, we can come up with an argument that there is something real there in the world, namely particles with mass and spin. So that you can use relationships between perspectives to arrive at some unproblematic perspective in varying knowledge about the world? Yeah, 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 exactly. Okay. And, um, I, and, the, and the other thing was just, too, it's just like, there are different ways in which perspectivism enters in science, and this is one way. But yeah, I completely, I mean, you can get a, pers a sort of, uh, 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 an account of this system from perspectivism, from this kind of perspectivism that doesn't end up with some kind of instrumentalism. Sure. Yeah. That's good. In the interest of staying on time, I think we only have time for one more question. So I apologize to those of you in the queue that we're not going to get to, but I urge you to button pull Marky during the copy break. Matthias. Yes, I'm uh, Thanks, Marky. I'm trying to understand to, to uh, what extent the perspectivism actually be unhappy with your discussion of the, the cases of this first, I mean, it seems like a perspectivist uh, uh, is not silly, wouldn't want to commit to this kind of broad relativism. So clearly some perspectives um, are <coughs> illuminating and ones I am interested in a certain phenomenon or have adopted a certain, in a certain context, I have adopted a certain kind of perspective, not anything goes. I mean, there's going to be some kind of representation of the phenomenon that's going to be the most illuminating and the best but then, you know, it just seems like the cases you discuss are just you know, perspectivism in, in, in action. And so, well, so in the turbulence case, you said, well, there's some common um, equations, but so I, I don't know that the, the, the case is well enough, but I would, I would suspect that maybe then some of the models that are constructed with the help of those equations, don't, or many of them might not strictly satisfy the equations. So you still end, end up with models that are, strictly speaking, making incompatible claims, we think, like in the nuclear case. And then, you know, what a perspectivist could say, so here I have, you, you mean, the very next presented this perspective say, really, well, you make, you make my case. And then, what does the perspectivist, what does the perspectivist position add? Well, um, in the, I'll take the nuclear case. You have this, what looks like 
on the face of it, inconsistent claims about the system. And then how the inconsistency removed this is that with respect to this says, well, um, each of these models is best suited to represent a particular aspect of the phenomenon. And then there's no inconsistency anymore because that model A represents is best suited to represent feature B, and model C is best represented uh, the best that represents feature D. There's no longer the inconsistency that's staring at us when we say, okay, the nucleus is composed of little balls, no, it's composed out of fluffy waves or something. Well, so, but, you know, that would be okay if um, there wasn't, but then you say, okay, what, okay, what's the nature of the nucleus? What does the nucleus look like? Um, tell me a story about the atomic nucleus. And you can't because you don't have the resources because each of those models is saying something different. So you don't get rid of the inconsistency. You only, you only get rid of the inconsistency on some kind of very, very superficial level. But the fundamental inconsistency is still there. And in the turbulence cases, the fundamental inconsistency is not there. Because you only have on the face of it what looks like inconsistency. But really, the, the, the sort of basic uh, equations from fluid dynamics are not being contradicted. So the perspectivism, but and, and so I think actually when you just when you first asked me the question, I, I wanted to interrupt you because you said, well, okay, so the perspective is, you know, what is most elusive? Not anything goes, right? I agree with that. But the perspective is, what's the most illuminating? Um, but then you can say, well, the perspectivist mm -hmm. is committed to saying not what's the most illuminating but what's the most illuminating for x given p? And so that then opens all kinds of doors. So it's like, like what I said a little while ago, you know, it's, I'm perfectly happy with that there's no view from nowhere, but I don't think it follows that there's a view from everywhere. And it seems to me that that's what perspectivism embraces, that, you know, if I come along and say, oh, yeah, but Matthias, I like this because for me, that looks better than that for this problem, then, you know, there's no answer. Well, well so this is where I, I, I think your perspective is like when Carson wanted to design, I mean, that, or, or any, any non-silly perspective. <laughs> I mean, if we if we agree on what the phenomenon is we want to, to, to describe or explain, or so, so then then it won't be the case that, that we can just both adopt whatever um, model we want to. There's going to be some kind of criteria. If we do. Yeah. yeah, if we do. But, but I mean, and if you have some kind of hidden perspective on the world that, that I, I don't want to, you know, I mean, so it might be one that I find utterly unilluminated. And that's, so that's another way in which I could um, uh, rejoin your say, well, not anything else. Your perspective on the world just isn't very good. Um, Mark, you get the last word on this, and then we're going to have to draw it to a close. Yeah, it's just, I, I mean, I guess I don't, I don't feel the force of, mm -hmm. of the, I mean, I think that the problem is, is that, you know, you can talk about perspectivism in, you know, in the turbulence case, for example. Um, we can all be happy perspectivists. But that's because there's a background theory there that's doing the work. It's not perspectivism that's doing the work. It's the background theory that's doing the work. And when we don't have any nice background theory, what's perspectivism giving us? Instrumentalism, like in the nuclear case. So, and when we've got something nice, like the renormalization group and scale invariance, then perspectivism isn't adding anything. But when we've got problems, it's not providing us anything either. So that's, that's sort of how I see it. Thank you, Marty.